been it and how to how to become uh, a great scrum master and great servant leader so first question would be jeff uh, for you personally what are the features and who is the the great scrum master and the great servant leader how do you understand it so we understand the goal that we would like to achieve at the end of the road um so I, I, I've set um, unwittingly, I mean, I didn't go out to try and define anything, but I identified a number of aspects that seem to coincide with, or at least be common with people who were just really, really good at that role in the teams that I've come across. And I was... If I was going to have my time again, I'd probably try harder and harder to really narrow it down because nine characteristics is actually quite a lot, um, especially when you start trying to teach a course based on that, you realize nine is quite a lot. Um, but uh, there's, there's basically doing the role and then being, being the person, I suppose. So, I mean, the first thing that any Scrum Master's really got to get a hold of is to just get into new habits about ways of working. So, can they get something set up and working in an environment that's probably not going to be very helpful and might even be quite hostile to agile ways of working? Um, and just giving that team and the sort of bubble that they're operating in enough time to just establish themselves without getting swallowed up or beaten down by the system that they're in. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of resilience just to do that. But then if they can do that, then they can really start working on getting that team and that organization to a really collaborative enabling state. So you start seeing a lot of proactivity. You start seeing a lot of, um, you see more of a can do attitude rather than a, yeah, but we can't do that here kind of attitude. And you know, some of the, the people that really do that well have this 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 servant leadership ethos if you like this not lack of ego necessarily but they really want other people to succeed and fulfill their potential they believe in the capacity of other people you know they don't take the view that people are lazy they don't take the view that people are selfish they genuinely believe that people want to do a good job they they want to be successful um, and they will do whatever they can to help those people be able to achieve that um, <clears throat> so they need to be quite resourceful they need to be quite open-minded and creative and quite res you know, determined and thick skin sometimes as we say here so you know they don't take things too personally they're quite resilient um, they can they can speak truth to power, but without annoying people too much. But if I was to pick one of the one of the things that I think is the most important, it would be their ability to listen with empathy, their their ability to to hear things from other people's perspectives, and even if they don't agree with them, or even if they don't think even if they don't see the same situation in the same way, they can, they can understand why other people do. Um, and with that empathy, they can then build relationships. They can create a sense of psychological safety. They can, they can challenge without appearing threatening. It opens up all the other things that they need to be able to, to be good at <clears throat> if they can, hear people and hear people as 
as they are and as they see things. It was a bit of a long answer, wasn't it? But well, also the question, I think it's it's not the easiest one that's straightforward. So I uh, wouldn't expect any other answer. How to how do you begin the treasure uh, the, the, mm, the travel then the, the pathway? So uh, once we we know the goal, well, where would you advise us to to take the very first step? Become a, a servant leader. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think it's it's asking yourself that almost philosophical question about do you believe in the capacity of of, of the people that you're working with? You know, I've, I've been I've been in organisations where people don't. You know, and I often tell this story of because it's 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 one of the big stories from my career. If you like, for me personally, it was a it was a huge moment for me. I was relatively young, and I was teaching a class of you know, very well paid, very um, experienced, very confident managers at a very successful organisation, and we were talking about the concept of self-organizing cross-functional teams and how it's not about managing them it's about enabling them it's about you know giving them space giving them problems to solve rather than requirements to deliver and one of the people says but jeff people are lazy and you know if you give lazy people autonomy it's going to be chaos dreadful things will happen People need to be managed. And I was really worried about how to answer that question because I could tell, it was clear to me that this person had evidence to back that view up. They weren't just saying it for, to be annoying. They had genuinely seen evidence that people were lazy and people needed to be managed. Now I'd seen other evidence, but why would he why would he accept my world view because he'd seen this at first hand so i think well this is going to be a really quite tough day but luckily for me one of his colleagues from the same organization said well i've got a different experience to that because my people are pretty good so maybe you just haven't hired the right people um and we had a big discussion about if you trust people, yeah, sure, they might let you down. But if you don't trust people, they can never prove you right. Um, they can never prove themselves. You know, if the only way you can make someone trustworthy is to, is to give them the chance to potentially let you down, but also give them the chance to prove that they are trustworthy. And, and you know, there was an argument of what came first, you know, was, was the fact that he didn't trust people lead to the t people not appearing to be trustworthy or was the people not being trustworthy laid to his view and in a way it didn't really matter because if he's not going to change his view on that <clears throat> people will know you know I could say to you I trust you but my actions will actually prove that or not and and then what happens when something does go wrong do I then say aha see I knew you weren't trustworthy or do I interpret that as you did your best, you couldn't have foreseen that, how can we make this better? So your question was, how do you get started? And it was a long way around of saying, well, what is my view on human nature? Do I think people turn up to work wanting to do the best they can? What is my explanation for someone not doing very well? Is it because they are inherently lazy? Is it because they are inherently selfish or trust, untrustworthy? Or is it, you know, they did their best and they want they would like to learn how to get better? And if I, I can't prove my point of view, but I think if you have that negative view of human nature, then you haven't got a chance of being a servant leader. But once you have that, then it enables you to, to, to actually start from where you are. You can start looking at your situation differently. I don't know. Does that make sense? I believe so. 
of course, if there are any comments uh, from the audience, and please please feel free to uh, to participate. Uh, Michal speaking. So uh, to recap your, I can say, answer uh, to be good service uh, service leader, we should trust people and say it and see always things from the better side rather than good side, uh, worse side. Yeah. So so I have. A couple of things that I'll, I'll add to that. So I think you, thank you for summarising it and playing it back because it's made me think of a couple of things I, I want to say. So the first is that trust isn't yes or no. It's not black or white. It's not I trust you or I don't trust you. There are different degrees of, of trust. And I don't have to completely trust you to be a servant leader. I don't have to fully trust you with everything. I don't have to give you all of my passwords, all of my keys, um, sign over, sign over legal, you know, guardianship of my children. I don't have to go that far for you to prove that agile can work and we can we can work together. So I only need to trust you a bit, and then you can prove to me that you're worthy of that trust, and then maybe I'll trust you a little bit more, and we can get we can and likewise backwards and forwards. So we can we can start small and we can we can work this up. And part of you know an agile approach is is. Is, is to achieve that really it's it's don't put all of your commitment in one big block do something small work out what works and same with trust same with relationships um, and the second aspect of that is when you said about always thinking positively so i have this view that every dysfunctional behavior that i see is a symptom of an unmet need now what i mean by that is if i see someone being an absolute um not very nice person then that behavior isn't because they are an evil person. It's a cry for help. All right. It's, it's because they're lacking something. And this dysfunctional behavior is basically acting out because they haven't got something that they need. Now, that could be privacy. It could be security. It could be achievement. It could be recognition. It could be anything that they need as a human being that they haven't got. And so they're, 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 they're expressing that disappointment in a dysfunctional way. In a similar way to a you know, kid having a ten, temper tantrum because they're not allowed to stay up at night. It's, it's that kind of thing, right? And if you start looking at, look at, looking at things that way, of it's not that they are deliberately messing up. It's not that they're a bad person. This, this is, this is a, a natural response to them lacking something that they really, really need. Then you can start asking yourself, so what is it that they need? And if I give them that, or if I help them get that, the behavior will probably change for the better, naturally, rather than managing the behavior. So yes, I think to be a great servant leader, you have to have a positive view of human nature. You have to want other people to succeed. All right? And you have to learn to interpret things in a positive way, because you tend to get what you expect. Thanks, Michal. Thank, Thank you. you. The next one may be a little bit tricky, but I think it's also uh, maybe a little bit provocative because the next one, and I think a couple of people actually asked about it, would be how do you measure if you are a successful servant leader, so I think we can summarize those couple of questions to to that one. What are the factors and and the metrics of of my success as a servant leader? Yeah. Um. So in my book, I give the almost ultimate success metric as not being needed, but still being wanted. So if you know, if I was to walk away from this team, they would be upset because they actually like me they not necessarily as a person but they like the fact that i'm there they like the value that i can bring um, but actually me being there is an inhibitor than inhibitor to them being even more empowered so i need to i need to give them that space and so in from a incremental metric approach i'm generally looking at if how um let me take another way of looking at this. Basically, it's how autonomous are the teams in the organization, right? So 
I'm looking for self-management capability of the teams, and I, I, I tend to. I, I tend to think there are three variables at play when it comes to a team's ability to manage itself. One is their competence. So do they actually have the skills necessary to, to, to manage themselves? Are they able to plan? Are they able to argue? Are they able to make decisions? You know, are they able to um, reflect and, and adjust, inspect and adapt what they're doing? Do they have those, those skills to be able to do that? So competence. The second thing is confidence. So they may be able to do it, but if they don't have the confidence to do it, either because um, they're worried about consequences of, of their decisions or being overruled or getting it wrong, then, then they won't do that. So confidence and competence. And then the third is the conditions. So the, the environment that they're in. So some, or some teams can be really, really good at working for themselves as a team, but they're only one part of the system and they don't have the ability to, to deal with everything else. So um, their definition of done, for example, or the, the, the recruitment policies or reward policies or uh, contracts with third parties or anything like that, all of those things that can affect the team's ability to, to influence the overall system. So as a scrum master and a servant leader, I'd be looking at all of those aspects and thinking, well, are they, what are they, what's their competence level? with regards to self-management? What's their confidence level with regards to self-management? And how how much are they able to affect the overall system with their self-management? And <clears throat> that those aren't necessarily easy things to measure, but you're looking at, well, how, how much decision-making can they um, can they actually take hold of and take control over, take responsibility for, as opposed to how much are they looking to to it from me? I'd be looking at things like um, asking for permission is one step. You know, we we think we've done this, or we think we would like to do this. Can we do this, please? And then that's great. That's because they weren't identifying things like that before. But now later on. They're, they're not even asking for permission. They know it's the right thing. They know it's a good thing. If they get told that it wasn't the right thing, they could explain it and they'd have the confidence to be able to explain their decision-making process, their thought process. So they don't ask for permission anymore. If it goes wrong, then they'll just ask, they'll say sorry, and they will ask for uh, forgiveness. And um, that, without wishing to sort of upsell my work if you like that's where the team mastery work came went so I saw scrum masters working with their teams and each team was different okay and they have different needs based on the maturity of that team the confidence and the competence and the conditions and things but they were always looking for ways to get better so they would have regular conversations about well what do you need from me as your servant leader, as your scrum master, what do you need from me now, based on where you are as a team? And you know, what, what commitments are you gonna to make to each other and how are you gonna know you're getting better? And they would come up with their own milestones of development as a great agile team. And so together, the scrum master and the agile team can identify some common goals for that team autonomy that they want to work towards and recognize. Um, and mark them off as they are as a team what they need but agile team one and agile team two and agile team three might be at very different points with very different challenges and so saying well these are the the the, the metrics for every team would be kind of crazy so having that conversation having some kind of um, common patterns if you like can be helpful but every team needs to work that through with their own scrum master servant leader Okay, thank you. The next aspect of uh, being a servant leader, and I again, I combine a couple of questions to, to one, Fred. Uh, it's building respect as a servant leader. How do you make people respect you? Uh, I mean, the team. And then secondly, what's the balance? And I think uh, we, I mentioned it a little bit offline when, when we discussed, how do you find this balance between being leader and servant? Or maybe it's it's not about finding a balance because it's it's just coherent and, and you cannot distinguish these two. Because what I read from those questions, but how do I not get 
exploit it? How do how do, do I not allow people taking advantage of me mm. as a servant leader? How do I not cross this line? What would being taken advantage of look like, Yara? Uh, didn't specify, unfortunately, in the questions, but I can imagine that uh, there is this quite often, maybe a good example, which which is always being taught during, you know, scrum courses. A scrum master is not a, a secretary of a team, for instance, or it's not a uh, someone who does things for, for the team, right? It's rather than someone who empowers the team and, and guides, but very often in a bad implemented scrum, I think we see this, this situation where the scrum master becomes kind of a, indeed a servant, Without the without the leader, so how do we not allow this to happen? Mm. How do we build this respect and and the, the position uh, without you know then again balancing off for the leader perspective and and being in charge? Okay. So I'll 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 take that in reverse order. I think. So, the second part first, in terms of not becoming a secretary style servant um, and I'll, I'll sort of play back to my previous answer but emphasize a different part of it so just as the scrum master will often say to their team what do you need from me right now to help you become more self-managing more autonomous and sometimes that might involve a little bit of admin it might involve a little bit of secretarial work for want of a better word um, because they've got other things they need to focus on right now. And that might be the right thing. But just as the Scrum team should be saying to the Scrum Master, this is what we want from you, the Scrum Master has needs as well. And so that would be a two-way conversation. So what do I need from you as a team so that I can be successful in my role? And trying to find that common ground of, well, okay, well, I'm prepared to commit to this, but I'm not prepared to commit to that because I think that would have this kind of impact. And having that conversation, I think is something that I don't see enough teams having, but every time I've seen teams have that conversation, it's been incredibly helpful. Not just between Scrum Master and Development Team either. Development Team and Product Owner, Scrum Master and Product Owner, whole Scrum Team and wider organization, whatever it is, just having that open adult conversation about what do we need from each other? What do we expect from one another? And what are we prepared to commit to one another in order that we can all be successful? So that would be the first, that would be the first thing there, because if we have that conversation and the team say, well, we want you to do this. We want you to update all these things. We want to make sure there's enough station. We want to make sure that there's fresh cakes in the, in the, in the team space every day. That, and the scrum master, well, hold on a minute. That, that's not my role. Okay. We, we can, we can find someone else who can do that if we need to, but that's not my job. There's a second aspect to this, still on the, the, the first part of the question that I'm answering the second part of, makes sense to me. Um, and that is, as well as the Scrum team potentially taking advantage of, of the Scrum Master, there's also a risk that the Scrum Master, I'm not sure takes advantage of is the right phrase, but almost sacrifices their own autonomy because they enjoy helping so much. And so, it's 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 a nice thing that people want to help others all right and people are naturally drawn to the scrum master role if they do have a desire to help other people be successful but sometimes helping the team in the short term is not good for their long-term development but we have a pull because we get that instant feeling of i've helped and sometimes it's a little bit there's a little bit of, well, I need these people to hurt a little bit. All right. I kind of use the analogy of teaching my, my kids to ride their bike. If I didn't ever let them fall off, they would never learn to ride on their own. That kind of thing. And it's not nice as a parent to see your kid fall off the bike. All right. It's not nice as a scrum master to see your team you know, have a bit of trouble here, a bit of stress here, a bit of, a bit of a problem here. But that stress is needed sometimes so that they can build up their resilience and they can prove to themselves they can actually work, them, work their way through it. Now, Scrum Masters who aren't comfortable with that will come to the team's rescue too quickly and too often, and that team won't grow. They will learn a dependency upon that Scrum Master. So that they can sabotage that team growth themselves, even though it has good intentions. So now the second part, which was the first part, 
which is how can you build respect? Now I would say I, I, I don't have enough knowledge to be able to give a fully comprehensive answer of this because I think culturally respect is earned differently in different cultures and I don't know enough about each individual culture but I, I can probably say with some level of certainty that integrity is a common part of respect. So, and what I mean by that is doing what you say. Your words match your actions. Um, you have a, I was talking to somebody earlier today about um, this sort of indefinable quality that some people have where what you see is what you get. Whereas some people, you think, hold on a minute, I'm not sure that what you're saying to me is something you actually believe. I'm not, st I'm not saying you're lying to me, but I I'm not quite sure that when you say you're going to do that, you're actually going to do that. And it, I haven't really got a good word for that. But the positive interpretation of that is integrity. What you see is what you get. All right? And I think that builds respect. So one of the first, um, one of the first tips I give to people is don't make massive promises just just make lots of small promises that you can keep and keep them because then you build up that reputation of okay when when they say something I'm pretty confident it's going to happen be honest and transparent about your faults is another common for me at least in what I have seen pattern in people who command respect they don't pretend to be what they're not when something goes wrong they'll put their hand up when something goes right, they don't brag about it, but equally, they'll say this went well. They can own it. They won't try and take other people's success as their own. They make sure credit is given where it's due. These sort of general, sort of human, um, say characteristics or qualities, I suppose. I think there are others, but if you were. If you were to think of somebody that you really, really respected, what characteristics would you pull out? I would agree with trustworthy, integrity, uh, being reliable. That's, I think, being honest. So that's indeed all comes around integrity. Mm -hmm. And there's an element for of competence as well, I think, usually. Um, or at least knowing what you are good at and knowing what you're not good at. All right. and, and being able to command a certain amount of respect for doing what you do to the best of your ability. For me, I think most of it comes down to your words match your actions. Thank you. Uh, again, if there are any comments from the audience, uh, more than welcome. Once again, Michal speaking, if I can. Uh, okay, uh, I understand uh, what's, uh, uh, what's say, but uh, for example, if I'm Scrum Master, who is working mostly with services like CSIRT, uh, some security services, uh, and more or less the Scrum Master uh, born in this environment, he know everything about that or more or less uh, know everything what the team doing. And uh, next day he have to take, uh, take under uh, him some development team which work on some program. And he don't know nothing uh, regarding this matter of uh, coding and so on and uh, how what you would do uh, on the beginning uh, with this team to not be a secretary for them because okay scrum master don't in my opinion don't have to know exactly about uh, the, the matter of the project about the coding on service but i know that is good to know more or less something about the matter of the project this is helpful to, for communication with the team. And apparently you don't know nothing and you have to be the scrum master. This is possible. Of course, this is possible, but how to start such 
project uh, cooperation with the team uh, to on to not be on the beginning from the beginning be secretary. Uh, may, I hope you understand what I mean. Yeah, I think so. So um, I, I it, there's there's not consensus about this. So I have my opinion, um, but that opinion is not one that everybody shares. So my my opinion is that I would rather be a scrum master for a team where I didn't understand what they did than be a scrum master for a team where I did understand. I would prefer not to know. But I know a lot of people who would prefer the opposite. Now, the reason I would prefer not to know is because then I'm not tempted to take control. I'm not tempted to make decisions for the team. I can say with genuine, um, genuine honesty, genuine truth, that the team know better than me. All right. Sometimes I say that, and I don't necessarily mean it 100%. Right. But it's important that the team believe that they know better than me. But if, I, if I'm in a situation where I don't, and that is quite often the case, then I believe I can be my most effective as a coach and servant leader of this team. So my job then quite explicitly becomes not to hear them all out and make a decision, not to make a decision for them, but genuinely to help them think through their problems, find out where their challenges are, find out where I can help them by them identifying where they need help and helping them to see solutions to the problems that perhaps their limiting assumptions are giving them. It only really for me becomes a problem if I believe I'm going to either be held accountable for this team or that the team don't feel confident enough in their own ability and understanding to be able to make those decisions themselves and they don't feel they have enough safety to learn themselves. So in terms of where, where do you start, I would start pretty much how I would start anyway which would be getting the opinion of the people in the know to tell themselves in my presence the state of things. So they're not telling me, they're telling each other, but I'm there, all right? Because they're not, they're not telling me because I'm not gonna do anything with that information, apart from play it back to them or perhaps highlight some gaps that I might see because I'm, I'm seeing things from a completely childish perspective. In fact, I once said every scrum team should have a five-year-old on their team because the five-year-olds ask the best questions. Mm -hmm. I might go so far as to say three, because I've got a three-year-old at the moment, and he's asking ridiculously annoying questions. Um, but quite quite interesting questions in a way. You know, why this and why that? Um, and, you know, just putting words together in a, a very different way makes you think about things in a different way. But anyway, I'm slightly digressing. But being able to ask those really naive questions that if you worked in this environment you just wouldn't ask because well you just never do you kind of accept that wisdom um there's a there's a there's a phenomenon called entrenched expertise which basically means if i if i'm the expert with a hammer i see every problem as a nail and it's so easy to get into that habit but if you're if you've never seen a hammer before then it's a little bit easier to think about how you might deal with something differently. So there's one more thing I would say to this, and I would say this in lots of different contexts. So as well as being a scrum master in the past, an agile coach and working with people in these, in these guises, um, I'm also a professional coach. So I'll have one-to-one -one coaching clients, leadership, leadership, um, coaching clients. And part of my setup with these people is to just make sure that we're both clear on what coaching actually is. Okay. And so one of those conversations, well, part of that conversation will be the difference between a coach and a mentor, um, and the difference between a coach and a therapist. And as a coach, I'm not either of those things, but sometimes I am a mentor to some people. 
And sometimes some of my conversations feel a little bit like therapy with other people, all right? But I'm specifically engaging with this person in the role of a coach. Now, that's not to say that a coach is better than a mentor or a therapist. In fact, many people will benefit from having all three, okay? Just not with the same person. So I would encourage a team, as well as having a, a servant leader, especially if they're new, to have some kind of mentoring, to look up to experts in their field, perhaps within the organization, perhaps from outside the organization, perhaps it's uh, a YouTube channel that they subscribe to, um, whatever it may be, having somewhere that they can look to for growth and guidance and expertise and the answers, but it just wouldn't come from me. I'll stop talking and see if that helps in any way and whether you want to tweak your question or follow up your question. Yes, yes, thank, thank you for that. And this is discover uh, almost uh, my second question about the uh, PM who become a Scrum Master. In, in my organization, this is uh, often a like, often, uh, situation that PM uh, becomes Scrum Master and uh, uh, very often is empty, uh, like a uh, person who was PM and uh, Next day, his scrum master to I can say um, to not be PM in scrum master role. You I hope understand what I mean, but you answer already on this question: how to not be PM in cool. scrum master skin. Brilliant. And for for what it's worth, I was a project manager that became a scrum master, um, so it, it it can work. Uh, like with me, uh, I'm. I can say, I'm. I am still PM, but I'm starting work often and often like the Scrum Master, and this is tempting sometimes be uh, like Scrum Master and please do that. But I thinking that you should uh, uh, do something like that or that, and this is very often tempting to be. I can say. Uh, rather ask them what they need, tell them what I think to do. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but you'll understand my point of view. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think part, a big part of that, and I, I, this will, when I mentioned around confidence, competence and conditions earlier on, that applies to a servant leader as well. Yeah, and if, if for example, you, know, you, you you've effectively still got the job description of a project manager but you've been asked to take on the role of scrum master and the organization still has accountability lines that are saying you know if this project fails then it's on you as a project manager oh i mean scrum master then it's going to be much harder to say okay well this 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 is a decision for the team to take because if they make it a bad decision then my job's at stake or my bonus is at stake or my pay rise is at stake so there are conditions that will affect how easy it is to not take control uh, that are outside of that team dynamic. Uh, it's it's part of the job to start addressing those impediments, those organizational impediments that, that stop the, the functional behavior from happening and encourage more dysfunctional game playing behavior. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Thank you for reply thank you for answering a couple of questions that uh, that i had on my list from from the audience but already has been has been answered so thank you for that so just to mention that there were indeed those about uh let's see what not to do as a as a servant leader and i think that, that has been answered uh another question and that was also quite quite well answered already that it's about uh, the technical knowledge of a of a scrum master but the the other one would be uh whenever i'm scrum master as a servant leader uh should it be only my only role or can i and should i participate in some actions or would i lose the the high perspective then and i think that's also something that i personally for instance found very different opinions mm. when it comes to to that point should i as a scrum master take also part in in any kind of job being a, also having a role of analyst or very rarely developer, but, but quite often analyst, I would say, that's, that's commonly combined, uh, at least in, in my environment. Uh, or should I still keep as a Scrum Master and do nothing else? What's your opinion about it? 
So again, you're right. There, there are different, very different opinions and quite strong opinions on this. Um, my my personal opinion is I, I I like to get really good at what I do. Um, and so rather than, well, there's more chance I think of becoming a really really good scrum master if I do that role. But if I do other roles, then I'm going to split my attention. So it's not a hundred percent answer, but if I was going to not spend all of my time as a scrum master for a team and I had some extra time left, then and I, and I've still got the whole organizational change aspect to be going on with, then I would rather probably focus more on being a scrum master for another team rather than being an analyst within this team personally. I think if I've got more than one role within one team, that makes things a lot messier um, and a lot harder to to delineate. Not impossible, but a lot harder. And generally speaking, if uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, this incrementally distancing yourself a little bit, giving the team more and more space to fill that gap and become a bigger self-managing unit, then it sort of makes sense for me to, to have something else to be doing with my time as a Scrum Master. And if I've got that mature team where I'm you know, spending a little bit of time there, it gives me space to, to start the growth of another team that might need me a lot more. Um, so that would, that would make sense for me. But I guess you've got to find what works for you and your conditions. Um, there may be many situations where actually you just you just haven't got enough people to do all of those things and focus on one role, right? And you, know, you can actually get benefit from experiencing different aspects within the team. You can build up that empathy quicker. People might respect you more if you have more of that technical knowledge. The the, the culture and the, the organization differences uh, might might encourage different results. But that's that's where I stand on it. Thank you a lot. Uh, there were a couple of questions about difficulties in organization. So especially I believe whenever you're a kind of a evangelist of, of Scrum or Agile in general in a company yeah. or you are hired as an Agile coach because the company, and that's something that especially happens, at least from my experience in, in quite big companies, they've heard about Agile, so they of course want to implement it, but then you hit the wall. Mm -hmm. I think quite a couple of questions, quite a few questions were uh, concerning this. How do you work with organization that says they want to be agile, but you, you clearly see they, they don't really understand what it is about. It, in fact, they perhaps don't even want to be agile. Yeah. Well, being agile is a means to a particular end. So you mentioned organic agility is something that I co-created with Dave Snowden and Andrea Tomasini as a way not of creating an agile organization, but of creating a resilient organization, one that can actually cope with the unknown unknowns rather than try and plan and protect themselves from the unknown. And that's our natural human response is to try and protect against that. But organizations in a complex and very fast moving environment need to be more resilient. So looking at why an organization has decided to go down this agile route, usually, in my experience, I'd say nine times out of 10, that what they really want is resilience, not to be agile. Agile is a way of be helping them become resilient. So start talking about things in their language, start really finding out what their goals are, what their organizational goals are, and how agile might help them. Because generally, being agile as a company isn't the goal. It's what it helps us do or what it helps us be. Then we've got some commonality. Then we've got something that we can all work towards. Because when it's not like that, it's a case of, I like agile. I know agile is a good thing. You need to change. And you're wrong. And it's very adversarial. No one wants to admit that they were wrong. No one wants to admit that they need to change. Uh, and so they're always looking for a reason why this isn't the answer rather than looking for a way that this can help us. So I, you know, I, I recently, recently announced that I'm, I'm, I'm stopping teaching certain you know, certified scrum master courses and things like that. 
Um, because have a lot of people go to those courses and then try and be a scrum master in, in the real world, in their real organisations, and they haven't got the skills from those two days to help them deal with you know, senior managers who come in and, and change the product backlog, you know, just like that, or start moving the teams around or tell teams they have to work late or whatever, whatever is going on that stops this team from being really truly agile. And they, they just haven't got the answers to that. How do we deal with that? So what I've, where I've seen success is helping those people once they've got the understanding of what it is and you know some few tools and techniques that they can use to get things going is actually helping them deal with those situations in real time so having some ongoing coaching support you know every month go working through some real examples and usually their their people skills their relationship skills their dynamic skills their influencing skills their political skills their their ego management skills you know, flexing your your how you approach people um, with in a different way to get a different result. So looking at those situations that you you know if you're in a classroom with fifteen other people, you haven't got time to go through all of those. But what ifs? But what ifs? And in this situation, how would you deal with that? But the ongoing support, then you can. So that's something I think is really really important over time because. In, in, was it, is it, was it Einstein that says in theory there's no difference between, in theory, between theory and practice but in practice there is once you're outside of the classroom in the real world it's really quite hard but in theory it's really really simple and Scrum is very very simple um, so yeah, it's a really long winded way of saying um, trying to answer that question but bring me back and tell me if there's a part of that question that I didn't cover and I'll try again Oh, at least to my understanding, I, I've heard what I uh, what I expected. I mean, not what I expected, but you answered the question. I don't know about, about the others. Any comments? I think coming also to to the servant leader, because now we, we are heading uh, also to, to the how do you collaborate with organization. There were several questions regarding uh, how do I we, we kind of answered it at the very beginning, but very there were a couple of people that, that thought about how do I come from other industry and become a, a good scrum master? How do I internally in the organization build that skill? Uh, because this is something people, I think, looking for a guidance where to, where to start, where to kick off if they are interested in becoming scrum master, but how should they, what should be the first step? Um, I'm not sure what their first step should be. But I think an early step would be to talk to people in the role. Now, and this is, why one of the, this is one of the reasons why you know, I like supporting groups like this, because this is not just about coming and listening to someone talk about a book or something, but you get chance to know other people. You start building up a network, a community. You can start supporting each other. You can have a few conversations, especially if it's in person. You've got a chance to talk beforehand and afterwards. Uh, you know, and you'll find similar problems and you can talk them through. Maybe it's something you're facing, they've gone through already. So I would, you know, a lot of people who are, who are looking in, getting into a role like Scrum Master or Product Owner will go along to a, a meetup group and they'll start talking to people and say, so tell me a little bit about what you do and you know, the challenges you face and what it's like working there. Um, and that, I think, is a really good insight because you can start then imagining how you would deal with some of those situations. So I've quite often had people come to one of my workshops, one of my training courses, and they, they're, they're changing career. So I've had people that have left um, marketing, I've had people that have left teaching, people that have left um, nursing, and they've, they've come to Scrum Mastering because they've spoken to somebody who's you know, told them about this thing. And, oh, that, that sounds quite cool. You know, I think I might, I might be able to do that. And a lot of the Scrum Master characteristics that, I, that I've written about, they're not technical. They're, they're people things, right? Can you, do, do you have integrity? Can you, can you help people? Are you, are you diplomatic? Do you know, can you, can you challenge the status quo? Can you speak truth to power? These kinds of things. They're, they're skills that you can have in lots of other different professions. I, I, someone, um, so I recently did a, a train the trainer program. So I, I'm teaching other people to be able to train my courses and one of the people on there used to be in the police uh, so they were a crime scene investigator right 
So a lot of the skills that you have in there, looking at the things from different perspectives, hypothesizing, you know, look, talking to people and helping them, you know, helping interpret you know, what their gaps in their memory might be telling you or not. Um, mapping what one person's saying to what another person's saying, reading between the lines and playing that back. So lots of crossover skills. So I would say, look at the role from talking to somebody and think, is that a role that you would enjoy? And is that something that your skills, natural skills, things that you enjoy doing, would play to? Because if they don't, and you're doing it because it's, well, I can't imagine why anybody would want to be a scrum master because they think it's trendy or it's cool or whatever. It's a horrible name, isn't it? But um, what would, if, if you don't enjoy it, it can be a really challenging, oh yeah, I suppose any, it's the same with any role, isn't it? If you don't enjoy it, it can be quite, um, quite sad. But it, it is one of those roles that I think you need to be intrinsically motivated to do. Thank you a lot. Uh, I think the f at least two more, if I may. Sure. First one would be a, a little bit more general about the, the environment and the, the industry uh, as such. So there are a couple of questions. How do you see agile community and agile evolving uh, next couple of years? What threats do you do perhaps see to, to agile? Uh, there were some mentions also in the in the in the questions that, for instance, you know, uh, big companies again, big companies they try to to use agile, but in in a sense it's only a buzzword for them, right? And when people get, for instance, they get resistant about Scrum or agile in general because they saw the very bad implementation of it, yeah. and when someone trying to to implement it, although they never understood it, so people got, for instance, yeah, they 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 repellent to. Uh, to Scrum as such. So what threats and then how do you see the, f the future of, of Agile Scrum in the new future? Hmm. I've never been particularly good at predicting the future. But what I would say, I'm pretty confident in saying that the threats, the threats to not necessarily Agile itself, because I don't think it's uh, what you're saying there is is people's perception of agile and people's appetite for it um is you know the big uh, consultancy frameworks things like safe and deloitte's agile tube map and accenture's monstrosity whatever it is that they've they've created recently um that that is trying to use agile to help them sell their consultancy services. I, that, that, is, that is the threat for me. Um, it's, it's difficult because there's, there's this phrase that goes around, isn't it? nobody ever gets fired for hiring, insert name of consultancy here. Um, but they could also be in a, almost a perverse way, the savior, because I think it will allow the real agile to to more clearly differentiate itself um, because the battle isn't really about agile or waterfall it's agile or crappy agile isn't it um and so in terms of the future what i've what i'm betting on what i've just started to create and nurture is it's called the Agile Licensing Library. Now the idea behind the Agile Licensing Library basically stems from a problem that I had when I was an employee. So when I was a Scrum Master at my first big organization, we, we wanted to get some experts in to help us. So we wanted to get some Scrum training in, but at the time there were only like five people in the world that could teach Scrum and they were all in America and they all charged ridiculous amounts of money to come over and teach us. So that was our only choice and we did it for a little bit, but then eventually as a company we said, well, could you do this, Jeff? I said, well, I hate training. I said, yeah, but we're not gonna pay these Americans to come over and teach us all the time, so you've got to do this. I said, oh, okay, I'll do it. So we did that. Um, the, I was then licensed to teach that stuff. That meant we could, run classes a lot quicker, a lot cheaper, um, and it allowed for the, the, the knowledge to spread. And that was okay because it was, I mean, it was small. It wasn't, I mean, Scrum was still quite young. It was still a, 
very unheard of term in many ways, but at least it had that element of validity and, and you know, integrity about it. it, had a had a brand. But trying to get someone like Esther Derby in, for example, to help us with our retrospectives was much harder because she was Esther Derby. She was just Esther Derby. She wasn't the Scrum Alliance. She wasn't Scrum. And so from a senior management perspective, it was very difficult to convince them that we should get someone like her. And even though she was even more help, she would have been even more helpful than getting um, yeah, some scrum training in. Um, so we've got all these pockets of people around the world who have created incredibly helpful, incredibly good stuff, but they are to be in a nice way they're just very small you know they're insignificant against those these big brands these big machines so this agile licensing library is a way of trying to bring those artisan collaborators together if i'd have been able to say to senior management at um at, at british telecom 20 years ago there's lots of different parts of agile okay there's janet and lisa who do certified agile testing okay we need engineering practices stuff because if we yeah, we, we can run in iterations, but if, if our code's terrible, we're just going to build crap quicker. So we need to be able to, and these people do this, all right? And they are part of this umbrella, of the same umbrella that has, you know, Esther Derby, that has Roman Pickler, that has Jeff Watts, that has these, the, and it has that collective um, sense of um, corroboration, I suppose. So trying to get a bit more... Um, support for these artisan creators who have stuff that organizations need but don't necessarily see because the first thing they see is the big packaged machine if that makes sense so from the consulting right the big package of, uh, yeah fancy advertising i see apologies to any big fancy <laughs> consultants on the call tonight uh a little bit of a personal and a tricky one uh, that yeah. that popped up from the from the audience is, uh, what do you consider if you if you would like to share your biggest failure as a scrum master servant leader? Um, I'm not sure I could say the biggest, but I know the biggest uh, theme, and it's it's something that uh, it's. Um, it's something that I still work on. I'm still aware of. I still fall into the trap of, um, and I'm aware of it. But I'm a lot better at it than I used to, which is that rescuing thing that I that I mentioned earlier on. So I I love I love the feeling I get from solving people solving problems for people. I love it. And seeing someone seeing a team that have got this problem and thinking I I can I can take that away. I can solve it for them. Um, and then I do that, but then they think, oh, Jeff's good at solving these problems. Next time, Jeff, can you solve this? And it's the same for my, my, uh, my, my wife's parents. You know, they, 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 they have problems with technology. I'm, I'm not particularly good at technology, right? But they come to me if they can't log into Zoom or whatever, or their, their Wi-Fi is down or something, and I come around, and it's just, just much quicker for me to do it. So I do it. Now they're dependent upon me and every time, oh, Jeff, can you come around and do this? Which on the one hand is nice because I get that feeling, but equally they're, they're less and less capable of doing this on their own. So when I'm away for a couple of weeks, they won't even try to fix their wife here. They say, oh, we'll, 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 wait, we'll wait for Jeff to come back. And you know, that sense of stagnation, I'm undermining their ability to, to be self-sufficient. So that my biggest failure is, is liking to solve other people's problems liking to rescue and I, I work on it still always probably always will right because it's part of those things that that i enjoy thank you and uh, rafa commented maybe biggest fail first attempt in learning yes <laughs> yeah it's not the first attempt though i've been i've been i've been trying to learn this for a while <laughs> but thank you for the reframe uh, you mentioned something about the predicting, and there are a couple of, of very technical, very down to earth questions about writing a good user story or so. Uh, I'm very curious about your opinion on uh, estimates, because that's not really about you know being a leader. 
But if I may, one technical question. There is a lot of you know, discussion right now about do we estimate or we don't estimate the workload uh, as a, do you encourage as a Scrum Master? Do you rather go, let's drift away to, to this uh, very fashionable lately. Uh, let's not estimate, let's use metrics, let's use uh, historical data. Or do you still like, for instance, story points, I don't know, t-shirt science or- I, I actually it? like estimates. I actually like the process of estimation. I like a team to go through that process of estimation, not because the answer is gonna be right, but because they're asking themselves the kind of questions. So what do we actually need to do to make this happen? And it's not so much how long do we think it's gonna take, that's not the important bit. It's, you know, we, yeah, we need to do this and we need to do this and we need to do this. And maybe that's it. But sometimes when you say, we need to do this and we need to do that and we need to do this, somebody will say, oh yes, but we also need to do this. And actually that's not right because if we do that, then we'll have to do this. That's, where, that's the important thing for me, which you get from the estimation process. The other thing that you get from the estimation process, which is a bit meta and it, we, I could talk about this for ages, is it will help highlight our dependencies. So what I mean by that is, if we say, well, how long is this going to take? And the team say, well, if Yarek does it, it's going to take a day. But if Jeff does it, it takes a week, all right? Because Yarek's the only person that can do this, right? So, well, we've got to give it to Yarek then because we haven't got time for it to take a week. We've only got, we've got to cram this in. That helps us highlight where our big bottlenecks are, where our big risks are. And actually we might need to stop you from doing this stuff, right? Because ultimately, if you go, we're screwed. So that estimation process helps, I think helps teams in, in lots of different ways. But if it becomes about the accuracy of the estimates, then absolutely it causes all sorts of problems. So as a scrum master, I, think, I want them to have this conversation that estimation gives them, but I don't want them to be playing a game about accuracy of estimates. So how can I, how can I ma manufacture that uh, within the organization? So we estimated this was going to be an hour, right? Didn't we? I believe so. Yeah. We've run out already of time. Maybe. <laughs> Sorry, but this is, yeah, there were so many questions. I still try to group them. I think we kind of covered most of the topics. So perhaps there is someone else, if I may, just one more small question from, from the audience. Maybe me. Uh, hi, everyone. But maybe it will be not a small one. Uh, first of all, I must say it's a great meeting. And thanks, Yarek, for, for inviting such a great guest. And thanks, uh, Jeff, to be here with us. It's highly appreciated. And coming to the question, maybe expanding expanding a little bit the question about the future of Scrum or and Agile. Uh, they have experience with the empowered product teams uh, because it's a popular trend nowadays. And companies are trying this approach. And Scrum Master role is like it's not specified there. So do you have any experience with empowered product teams? And how can Scrum Master find a place for, for him, her, there? I, I, so yes. And when I wrote Product Mastery, I, there's a lot of stuff in there that, that overlaps with um, Scrum Mastery in a way because the Product Mastery book isn't about how to be an amazing product manager from a technical perspective. It's about how to be a great product owner from a personal perspective. And my view, and I've seen this in practice, is that great product owners actually are almost half Scrum Masters in a way because they are servant leaders of product management. They, they, they value an autonomous, engaged team. They're not there to tell the team exactly what to do. They give teams problems to solve that rather than requirements to deliver. Yeah, they're, they're creating psychological safety so that they're not lying about the estimation process. So yeah, the empowered product team is, is what Scrum was intended to do. And part of the Scrum Master role was to bring that product person and the people who are building it together so closely, so tightly, and then work on the outside of that environment so that the, the environment is more supportive, that this Scrum Master can walk away and they've got, they've got that unit. Now, whether that stays together long enough, it determines whether that Scrum Master can walk away or not. Because you know? sometimes product owners will move on and team members will move on and then you have to work, through, work it through again. But in theory, then a, a product, uh, an empowered product team shouldn't in the long term need a Scrum Master. So thank you. Thank you a lot, Jeff. Uh, thank you a lot once again. Sincerely, thanks for, for participating. It was really a, 
uh, very nice meeting and we I think we've learned a lot from from an expert so once again thank everyone for uh, participating I think there is there's still gonna be a small uh, questioner from coming from Beata in a second as usually about uh, how we can improve so please guys if you can uh, participate uh, we would really really appreciate it and uh, Jeff again thank you for for your time I hope it's not the last uh, time and last opportunity for us to speak and uh, Perhaps in the future we can we can repeat such sessions. Nice one. Yeah, thank you. And far be it from me to in any way influence how you structure your your sessions. But please, like I said, do use these to to don't just come and listen to somebody else, but come to connect, build that community, support each other, share your experiences. Um, you've got so much to share to each other. Don't think that someone on the other side of the world who's written a book has got all the answers. You've got a lot more answers amongst yourselves than I've got. Right. So share that amongst yourselves. Thank you. Nice, nice summary. Actually, just just for FYI, it's uh, how we do or how we did before the COVID. So Vinna which was usually about you know gathering in uh, mm. physically in one place and discussing or discussing a specific problem or or a theme. But indeed, yeah, COVID changed a little bit, and now it's kind of a hybrid. Uh, then we decided to also have cool. guests like you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank See you, you all once again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank okay. you, Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.